Do you like scary stories? Then cozy on up to the fire and I'll tell you a few. A couple about skinwalkers, a couple about Ouija boards, and the rest are good old-fashioned ghost stories. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content and live chat. And if you like the video, give it a thumbs up, share the link, and comment below. The great gods of YouTube will be most happy if you do. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. In 2012, I was in combat training with the Marine Corps in Southern California. I was on fire watch one night at 2 a.m. with two Navajo guys. We somehow got on the subject of skinwalkers, and we started telling stories that our grandparents and others have told about their encounters with these creatures. We did this even though the belief is, if you mention the name skinwalker out loud, one might come looking for you. We were getting a little creeped out by the stories, and while we were talking, we heard the most distorted coyote howl that any of us had ever heard before. It almost sounded like somebody was playing a vinyl record of a coyote howl and then pressing their finger on the turntable to slow it down. And it seemed to be coming from about 50 yards away. We all just stood there frozen in fear and looking at each other, wondering what the hell it was we were hearing. We pointed our flashlights in the direction of the howl, and we saw what looked like a coyote head sitting on a fence post. We all just stared at it in absolute silence, shaking with fear. The head was pointed in our direction, and the eyes were open, but they didn't shine and reflect the light from our flashlights. They were just dead and lifeless, making it all the more creepy. I finally said, Maybe someone found a dead coyote and put the head on the post? Sometimes people will do that to keep other coyotes away. Right after I said that, the head turned slightly to the left and moved off of the fence. Then from behind the post, a large coyote walked out on its hind legs with its jaw and tongue dangling like they were broken. Then it just walked off into the darkness, out of reach of our flashlights. We all booked it back to camp, and we didn't get a proper night's sleep in the entire time we were there after that. All three of us saw it, and all three of us knew what we saw. A skinwalker. Moral of the story? Speak of the devil, and he shall appear. This happened in Arizona when I was nine years old and living with my aunt, uncle, two sisters, and my aunt's boyfriend. In case that's confusing to anyone, my aunt and uncle are brother and sister and her boyfriend lived with us too. All three of the adults worked at night and wouldn't get home until 1 a.m. In the house with me were my seven and 10 year old sisters. We lived in a pretty rough neighborhood so always made sure to have the doors and windows locked at night. One night at 11 p.m., both of my sisters were sleeping when I heard a knock at the door. I thought it was one of the adults come home from work until I looked at the clock and realized it was way too early for them to be home. Then I heard what sounded like my aunt's voice coming from outside. She said, Hey, sweetie, open up the door. I forgot my key. Well, that scared me because my aunt doesn't carry a house key with her. Also, as a precaution, she always stressed me to never open the door to anyone and that she would call me on the phone from outside to tell me she was there and she hadn't called. Nothing about this situation felt right. I wanted to run upstairs, lock myself in a room and call the police. But I was so scared, I just stood there, frozen in place. I slowly walked over to look out the door's peephole, and I saw some sort of creature standing there. It was tall and hairy, yet very bony. That's when I was finally able to run upstairs and lock myself in the bedroom, but I called my aunt, not the police. I told her she needed to come home right away. 
Afterwards, she told me I was crying when I called. I have no memory of doing that, but thank God I did, because she said that was the only reason she believed me and came home, because I sounded so scared and was crying. From then on, they always made sure at least one adult was with us at night. I don't know for sure what I encountered, but a skinwalker was the first thing that came to mind. As a child growing up in Chicago, I shared a bedroom with my younger brother. We had bunk beds, and I had the top one. My brother used to always talk to his imaginary friend Georgie whenever he was playing alone in our room, but I never gave it much thought. We had a small desk in our room against the far wall. One night, I woke up to a noise and thought maybe my brother had fallen out of bed. I looked down, but my brother was still asleep in bed. But then I looked across the room, and I saw a small child that looked like a shadow, and it was sitting at the desk. It turned its head to look at me, and I was so scared, I hid under the covers and prayed hard for it to go away, and when I looked again, it was gone. A few days later, I was again awoken by that same sound. Looking down, I saw my brother was half on and half off the bunk, sound asleep. I went to lay back down, when I saw that same shadow child crawling across the ceiling on the far side of the room. Since I was on the top bunk and very close to the ceiling, I was terrified and screamed. When I did, the shadow child looked at me, then started crawling across the ceiling towards me. Once again I dove under the covers and prayed hard for it to go away. I must have either fallen back to sleep or passed out from fear, because I don't remember what happened after that. If you ask him today, my younger brother will tell you that Georgie was a real person and they were friends. But my older brother will tell you that he felt a presence in the house and that somebody would tap him on the shoulder when he was studying late at night. So did I truly see a ghost? Or was it just my mind being influenced by my older brother's story? I believe I saw a ghost. About 15 years ago, I was trying to sell my recently deceased uncle's home. It was one of those southern-style three-story carriage homes that was more or less beaten up through years of neglect. My uncle suffered from mental illness, so it was no surprise that he let things go, and I had to do a few repairs before selling it. One hot summer day, while working with the contractor, we noticed a cold draft coming through the first floor home office. Now that was strange, because the AC wasn't hooked up yet, and it was 94 degrees outside. So he thought maybe the airflow could be coming from the basement, and he went down to check. Five minutes went by, then ten. I eventually opened the basement door and yelled down to him, asking if he was okay. In reply, I heard an unfamiliar male voice yell out, Help me! From deep inside the basement. I quickly ran downstairs, only to find the contractor tied up and knocked out, completely unconscious. Thinking that I was dealing with a home invasion, I called the police and an ambulance. When he regained consciousness, the contractor said he had no memory of what happened or of calling out for help. The police conducted a full investigation, but in the end, there was no conclusion. Nobody knew what happened. Once the home was no longer considered a potential crime scene, my husband and I went back, looking for any sign of a break-in but we found nothing. Then, we heard a loud noise in the basement. We ran downstairs, only to be met with a blast of cold air. Then suddenly, right before our eyes, part of the basement floor literally collapsed to reveal a perfectly square hole. My husband and I were shaken. Just moments ago, everything was fine. Now there was a three-by-three-foot square hole in the floor. My husband went over to look, and he said, 
Honey, call the cops again. There's a dead body in there. The police came, and after they finished their investigation, they ended up finding two bodies in that hole, both grown men. My first thought was that the killer had to be my late uncle. He owned the house since the age of 18, after his parents died. It was determined that the cause of death was torture and blunt force trauma to the head, for both bodies. But we don't know who they are, who killed them, or why. To this day, I have no idea who was screaming for help that day, or if my uncle was the murderer. It's left my entire family in the dark, and the foundation of the house has been destroyed. We ended up knocking down the house entirely, and just selling the land. While walking through a fixer-upper in a trendy neighborhood in Knoxville, Tennessee, my realtor and I ran into a very unwelcome and creepy surprise. The house was built in the late 1940s, and it appeared to have great bones. It only needed a little updating. While walking through, I noticed something weird about the wall in the hallway. Taking a closer look, I told my agent, There's a dead space behind the wall. I thought it might be a fireplace that could be restored, so I carefully pried off some of the loose paneling that was covering the hidden space. But behind the paneling was a staircase to the second floor of the house. It had been boarded up and completely shut off from the rest of the house. Why would somebody board up a second level of a house and then hide the staircase? And more importantly, how did I not realize that there was a second story to the house in the first place? I ran outside with my agent to get a better look. I asked if she knew that the house had two levels, but she said she didn't. Once we went back inside, things began to get really creepy. As we rounded the corner on our way to the dining room, I saw that hanging from the doorway between the living room and the dining room was a long silk wedding dress, complete with veil. It was old and slightly yellow from age. The hair on the back of my neck stood up straight, and I asked my agent, Was that there the first time we came through? Neither of us had seen the dress just moments before, so we got out of there pretty fast, and I decided not to buy the property. But I've kept my eye on it ever since. When it didn't sell, the house was listed for rent, but it's still vacant. I wonder why. Last summer, a friend and I played with the Ouija board. We bought the board, looked up the rules online, lit a candle, and followed the instructions. At first, nothing happened. Then the planchette started going really slowly, but not making any sense. We looked up what to do if nothing was working, and it said to take a break and come back later. So we did. After that, as soon as we would start playing again, the board would answer our questions. The first thing I found alarming is that it told us there were 13 entities in the room with us. I asked how many of them were evil, and it said, all but one. Then it spelled out my last name. I kept asking who or what the spirits were, but all the board would do was tell me that the bad spirits liked me. When I asked why, it spelled out, you bleed. Now, I'm a former self-harmer, and I used to cut myself and have suicidal thoughts. I instinctively knew that it was talking about the fact that these things liked that I harm myself, and I found that terrifying. So we said goodbye and took another break. But when we came back later, I asked if there was anything I should know, and the board told me a secret that my friend was keeping from me. She desperately tried to keep it from telling me, but the harder she tried, the more embarrassing details it revealed to me. We stopped then because neither one of us could handle this anymore. We threw the board away in a McDonald's dumpster and tried not to think about it anymore. But two weeks later, to our complete shock, 
the board appeared out of nowhere in the back seat of her mother's car. We have no idea how it got there. Her mom didn't even know that we had played with the Ouija board because we would have gotten into a lot of trouble had she known. After the board came back, I felt constantly watched and I sensed a dark presence in my house. There were unexplained noises all the time, too. One time, my phone glitched out and I heard a distorted voice on the other end. Then the phone shut itself off. Another time, I heard a loud bang next to my bed in the night. It sounded like somebody was punching the wall as hard as they could. I heard noises in the cupboard, and all the cups and bowls had been flipped over completely. All of this eventually died down, although once in a while, I still sense a heavy presence in the house to this day. Sometimes, whatever you contact with a Ouija board can stay with you. One time I had something attached to me. I would see things, then hear knocking and scratching inside of my wall, and my bed would shake. I left myself open before, but I now know how to set up a spiritual protection before I use something like a Ouija board. You have to be very careful when dealing with the spirit world. One time my sister and her friend used a Ouija board and it said that her friend would try to kill herself, and a few weeks later, she did try to kill herself by drinking bleach. And my mother used a Ouija board many years ago when she was pregnant. She asked if the baby would be a boy or a girl. The planchette just kept spinning around in a circle faster and faster, and it wouldn't give her an answer. And my mom miscarried. I don't know exactly what we connect to through these boards, but they can be very dark and dangerous. A few years ago in high school, my friends and I decided to play with the Ouija board. We'd done it before, with varying degrees of success. This time, a female friend and I were the two chosen to have our fingers on the planchette. This thing was moving crazy fast, faster than I'd ever seen it move before. It seemed to be getting quite agitated by some of the guys in our group who were joking around, not taking it seriously. They kept laughing and asking for a sign that somebody was there, and the board was pretty much telling them to shut up and stop talking. I told them, Guys, seriously, stop being rude. This is starting to kind of freak me out now. Because I was getting nervous, one of the guys took my place. He was a bit more serious than the others. Almost immediately, the board started spelling out, Don't open the door. Well, we were in the basement and there was only one door, so we all kind of looked over at it nervously. At that point, I was getting anxious, so I hid my face. And as soon as I did that, the board spelled out, don't hide from me. Everyone was freaking out. The guy who had his hands on the planchette literally started to cry. He wanted to quit, but the rule of the game is you can't take your hands off the planchette until it says goodbye. It took about 10 minutes of asking dumb questions before the planchette finally slid over to goodbye. Some of the guys speculated that the message about the door meant don't open the door to the spirit world. Their reasoning is that we were told to never ask for a sign or else it lets the spirit roam free outside of the board. And they had been asking for a sign earlier, so that speculation made some sense. I bet they never tried that again. When I was 12 and my sister 10, she was still very much into Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, and that kind of thing. One day we got home from school and our mom had to leave for work right away, so we would be left home alone, which my sister did not like. Whenever we were home alone, she always complained that the walls would move. 
Our walls were made of fake wood paneling with wood knots painted on the panels. Every once in a while, you could see a face form in the pattern of the knots on the wall. That day when we were home alone, I heard something crash. Then I heard the sound of my sister screaming up in our bedroom. I ran upstairs to see if she was okay, and when I entered our room, things were broken and strewn all across the floor. But the most bizarre part was that all of the patterns in the knots in the wall had gathered at the corner where my sister's bed was, and they were forming horrible-looking faces that scared my sister and me half to death. When our parents got home, they found us on the couch crying. Our family moved out shortly after that incident. Because we were both so young, neither of us had a cell phone, so we didn't have any hard evidence to back it up. I still find that memory creepy as hell, and I believe that there was some presence, whether demonic or just malevolent, that caused those events to happen. Back in the 90s, my friends and I were at a club called Gotham City in New Haven, Connecticut. There was a guy going around with an old Polaroid camera, the kind that spits out a picture, and you have to wait a couple of minutes before it develops. When the photo was first taken, they didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But when we got home, I took a closer look, and I noticed a thick smoke surrounding my friend's boyfriend. The smoke was in the shape of a humanoid creature, and it had horns. This thing literally had its arm around his shoulder, and it was smiling at him. We freaked out and told my friend's parents. Her stepfather was friends with Lorraine Warren. We lived in the same town as Lorraine, so we brought the photo to her. She said it was a demon, and it was either haunting the club, the photographer, or my friend's boyfriend. She told us to burn the photo, and we did. End of story. I'd like to thank you all so much for listening tonight and for being part of my family of darkness. Now click or tap on the screen above to hear more stories like this so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends. <laughs>